and the last speaker of the section of computer analytics at ICM is uh, Jacob Fox, from, uh, assistant professor at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of MIT. And uh, what to say about Jacob? Everybody, everybody knows him in the, in the combinator community as uh, one, of, one of our rising stars. I would say that uh, I looked at, at his web page because I mean this is uh, this is what I got is somehow not sufficiently sufficiently detailed, uh, and I found that he has uh, 70 papers which uh, uh, published, which uh, somehow doesn't seem too much, you know, and it's perhaps not important to mention here, but actually he got his PhD in, uh, four years ago, you know, and uh, in this context it is actually a really uh, remarkable, remarkable thing. And uh, so as I said, he's a STEM professor now at, at uh, MIT and he's moving to to the position at Stanford, and in the meantime, next spring he will give an active one for Lezungen in the, in the at the age, you know, and uh, so, uh, of course he got uh, several prizes, but I will not mention them, and uh, so let us welcome Jacob. Uh, thank you, Jörg. Uh, I want to thank the uh, organizing committee for inviting me and uh, putting together this very nice conference. And I want to thank you for showing up to the last of the Combinator Works talks. Uh, I will be talking about the powerful graph me uh, regularity method, which was pioneered by Samaretti. So, uh, what is a graph? A graph has a set of vertices V and a set of edges V. E. The edges are pairs of vertices. So on the right, you see a depiction of a graph with six vertices and seven edges connecting certain pairs of them. Much of the world can be described like graphs. Some examples include the internet. So you have computers as vertices, and they're connected by links. The World Wide Web with web pages and hyperlinks. Social networks like Facebook with users and friendships. Chemical networks with atoms and chemical bonds. Biological networks like the brain with neurons and synapses. Engineered networks like integrated circuits with transistors and wires. And uh, these examples uh, come from the, the beautiful recent book by Lobos on this topic. Um, so understanding the, the structure of these graphs is, can yield critical insights into uh, topics ranging from the spread of disease to the properties of complex crystals. However, it's often quite difficult to analyze the structure of large graphs. Um, these examples each have over a, a billion vertices, and it remains a, a big challenge to analyze the structure of large networks, and it's yield, yielded a lot of exciting research in recent years. So, uh, I want to talk about Samaretti's regularity lemma, which is a rough structural result which holds for all graphs. It's one of the most powerful tools in graph theory, and it's really created a paradigm shift in how we view and study graphs. Uh, if you look at the old papers in graph theory, it's often the case that they look at them as individual vertices and edges, much more local structures. And uh, the, the regularity lemma allows you to take a much more global approach which also tells you a lot of interesting properties, both globally and locally. Uh, an early version of the regularity lemma was used by Samaretti in his proof of the, his famous result that the, uh, the any dense subset of the positive integers contains arbitrarily long arithmetic regressions. Um, and uh, Samaretti uh, uh, got the Apple Prize a couple of years ago, and, and this was in part for this work. Now, what does the regularity lemma say? Roughly, the vertex set of every large graph can be partitioned into a bounded number of roughly equal sized parts so that the graph is random like between almost all pairs of parts. And we need to understand what this notion of random like is. And this is uh, called regularity. So let x and y be vertex subsets of a graph G. And bxy denotes the number of pairs in x times y that are edges. 
The density between x and y is just the fraction of pairs in x times y that are edges. Now, here's the key definition called irregularity between two vertex subsets. The irregularity between two vertex subsets, x and y, is the maximum over all subsets a of x and b of y of the absolute value of the number of edges between a and b minus the number of edges you would expect there to be between a and b given the density between x and y and the sizes of a and b. Uh, so if this irregularity is small, it tells you that the graph is very uniform or random-like between these two vertex subsets. And you call the graph, the, the, the two vertex subsets, epsilon regular if the irregularity between them is at most an epsilon fraction of the size of x times y. So if it's epsilon regular with epsilon small, then the graph looks very random-like between x and y. Now, the irregularity of a vertex partition is just the sum of the irregularities over all pairs of parts in your vertex partition. <coughs> and you call the partition epsilon regular if the irregularity is at most, of so that partition is at most an epsilon fraction of the size of the v squared. So if it's epsilon regular with epsilon small, it's telling us that the graph looks random-like between almost all pairs of parts. So now we can state the regularity of my epsilon already. It says that for each epsilon greater than zero, there is an m of epsilon, so that every graph g has an epsilon regular vertex partition with at most m of epsilon parts, a small number of parts. Now, in this statement of the regularity lemma, which is due to low loss and in this form, and it's equivalent to the original version, uh, the parts don't necessarily have to have the same size. It's not too difficult to show that m of epsilon won't change much if you uh, add the condition that all parts are essentially the same size, so they differ by at most one in size. Now, this regularity lemma has an enormous number of applications, and to get good quantitative bounds for the various applications, you'd like the m of epsilon to be small as a function of epsilon. So the question is, how big is m of epsilon? <coughs> uh, and there was the original proof of the regularity lemma by Samaretti showed that m of epsilon uh, can be bounded using the tower function. So m of epsilon is at, at most a tower of twos, two to the two to the two to the two. This tower height is one over epsilon squared. So that seems quite unfortunate. However, it was uh, a problem for about 20 years to try to improve the bound of the regularity lemma, and uh, there was some hope in, for this until uh, Gower showed that this tower height is indeed necessary. So m of epsilon is at least a tower of height, a power of 1 over epsilon. Uh, and, and Gower was asked to determine the order of the tower height for m of epsilon. Uh, recently, my student, Laszlo Miklos Lobos, and I showed that the tower height is indeed on the order of 1 over epsilon squared, answering this question. And uh, there's a take-home message here. Um, if you've seen the, the movie Spider-Man and remember the line, with great power comes great responsibility, the, great, the take home message here is with great power that comes from the regularity level. With great power comes weak quantitative estimates. Um, so, how do we prove the regularity level? So, there's a key definition called the mean square density of a partition. It's a very nice function of, of a partition, it's an average of the density squared between the pairs of parts. Now, the density between two subsets is between 0 and 1, so the density squared will also be between 0 and 1. And this is a weighted average of the density squared between the various pairs of parts of the partition. So it has some very nice properties. Um, one nice property is because it's an average of numbers between 0 and 1, it has to be between 0 and 1. 
Another nice property is that if you take a refinement of a partition, so you cut up each part into smaller parts, and you get a new partition, then the mean square density cannot decrease. It can either stay the same or go up. And this follows from an application of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So how do you prove the regularity lemma? Well, there's a, a key claim. So you have a partition P with K parts, and if, if it's not epsilon regular, then you can refine it into another partition P prime, which has at most an exponential number of parts, such that the mean square density goes up by at most epsilon squared. Uh, at least epsilon squared. And the way you prove this is, for each pair of parts, there's going to be a subset of, uh, of each uh, part, uh, and you take that subset and its complement, and that gives you a partition of each part into two parts, for every other part. And uh, using that, you get a partition, by refining all those partitions into two parts, you get a partition of each part into the most two to the k plus one parts. And in total, you get, uh, for each of the parts, uh, two to the k plus one parts, so in total you get at most k times two to the k plus one parts. You get this re refinement p prime, and instead of using the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, if you don't have equalities uh, there, you can improve on the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, you get a defect inequality, and you can improve on it and get this extra epsilon squared. So this is the key claim for the proof of the regularity lemma, and now from that it's pretty easy to prove the regularity lemma, start with a partition with one part, and keep refining it until you arrive at an epsilon regular partition. Each time you refine it, your mean square density is going up by at least epsilon squared. You started off at zero. So at some point you're going to get stuck with an epsilon regular partition. And you've done this within at most one over epsilon squared iterations. You'll arrive at this epsilon regular partition and because each step you go up an exponential number of parts, the number of parts of your final partition is at most a tower of height one over epsilon squared. So that's the, the proof idea behind the, the regularity lemma. Now, the regularity lemma is most powerful when used in combination with something called the counting lemma for embedding small graphs. <coughs> the counting lemma uh, tells you that the counts of small subgraphs will behave as you would expect in a random graph, assuming that things behave regularly. So as an example, the triangle counting lemma says that if you have three subsets of a, a graph, x, y, and z, and each pair of these parts is epsilon regular, then the number of triangles across the three parts is about the product of the three densities across the pairs times the sizes of the, the parts. And this is what you would expect in a random graph of these densities across the pairs. And this is true up to three epsilon times the size of x times the size of y times the size of z. And if you want to prove this, uh, you can start by trying to embed the triangles one vertex at a time. And you can notice quite quickly that if you pick a vertex of x, apart from some small number of vertices in x, the size of its neighborhood in y and the size of its neighborhood in z is about what, what you expect. Uh, you, so you get that from the regularity between x and y and the regularity between x and z. Now for a given vertex, if you have its neighborhoods using the regularity between y and z, you get that it's in about the right number of triangles uh, using the regularity here. And so that's one way of proving the counting lemma. And there's some other nice ways using the teles telescoping sums. Uh, but this whole proof generalizes for graphs without any work, extra work. So that's, that's the idea of the regularity method. You use these two tools in combination. Uh, one of the most powerful applications of, of the regularity method is the graph removal lemma. And it says that for each epsilon greater than zero in graph H on little h vertices, there's going to be a delta greater than zero, so that every graph of n vertices with few copies of H, so you have at most delta times n to the H copies of H, can be made H-free, so you can delete all the copies of H by just removing a small number of edges, the most epsilon n squared edges. And, uh, this had, is a really powerful result. It was originally proved for triangles by Rouge and Semreddy in 76, although the proof that we'll see in a minute, that it's pretty standard, 
uh, it generalizes to all graphs. And uh, it has many applications in extremal graph theory and added number theory, theoretical computer science, and discrete geometry. Um, for example, uh, just the triangle removal lemma already implies uh, Ross theorem, which is the first case of Samaretti's theorem, that uh, dense subsets of the integers contain three term arithmetic regressions. So, how do you prove the graph removal lemma? Well, you apply Samaretti's regularity lemma with a very small uh, approximation parameter. So, your epsilon there, which is different than this epsilon, but related, you'll, you'll apply it with it being very small. And then you're going to delete the edges between pairs which are either irregular or sparse. So the pairs which are irregular, there are not too many of them. And so you haven't deleted many edges. You also delete edges between pairs which are sparse. So the density between them is small. And again, because it's sparse, there's not too many of those edges. So you get this cleaned up graph where you deleted very few edges at most epsilon n squared. And if there's any copy of H that remains, its edges have to go between pairs which are both dense and regular. And from the counting lemma, you then get that there would have to be at least delta times n to the H copies of H. So in this subgraph, you get at least delta n to the H copies of H. And so therefore, in the original graph, you'd also get at least delta n to the H copies of H, uh, which we're assuming is not the case. And so, we know then that there's no copy of H in the, the subgraph that we've created. And that, that proves the graph removal lemma. Now, there's a major drawback here that the dependence of delta uh, on the epsilon and H is rather horrendous because we're using the, the, the regularity lemma here. And it's been a, a major problem in this area to find a new proof of the graph removal lemma which gives better quantitative bounds. Now, uh, a result in this direction um, I showed a few years back, says that instead of a bound on 1 over delta, which is a tower of 2s of height, a power of 1 over epsilon, you can improve it to a tower of 2s of height uh, logarithmic in 1 over epsilon. Okay, so that's still a, an enormous bound, but it's, it's progress. And uh, in the other direction, we only have just a slightly super polynomial lower bound. So it's quasi-polynomial of the form uh, 1 over epsilon to the log 1 over epsilon. Um, and it's a really exciting problem in this area to close the gaps between the lower and upper bound here. Um, and I want to give you an idea of the proof, this logarithmic tower height bound. Uh, so we'll do it just for triangles. Suppose we had three vertex subsets. You can think of these as parts of some partition uh, with many other parts. And if you already know that there's few triangles going across these three subsets, there's a good reason for this. What is the reason? Well, you can partition, there's going to be a pair of these parts, bi and bj, where you can partition the vertex sets. So you have these partitions qi of bi and qj of bj. And they don't have too many parts. And for a lot of the pairs of parts, so a constant fraction of the pairs of parts, you're going to have that the density between them is quite small. So this is something that's stronger than regularity here. Um, you're going to get density close to zero between a constant, almost a constant fraction of the, the pairs of parts in these partitions. And you'd like to do a density increment argument, just like we did before. There, we had to use a 1 over epsilon squared number of steps. And here, we'd like to use only a logarithmic and 1 over epsilon number of steps. And you can't use the mean square density. It just doesn't work. So instead, you use the mean entropy density, which is the function x log x, um, instead of y equals x squared. And uh, you can use these ideas together and get an improved bound on the graph removal lemma by only taking the logarithmic number Okay. So what about a regularity, lemma, a regularity method for sparse graphs? The original regularity method is only useful for dense graphs where a constant fraction of the pairs of vertices are adjacent. 
And the reason for this is that for sparse graphs, when almost all pairs of vertices are not adjacent, the regularity lemma and the counting lemma are not meaningful because the error terms in both of them are too large. So you'd like to have a meaningful regularity lemma and counting lemma in sparse graphs. And this is part of a general program that was introduced by Kohayatawa and Rudel in the 1990s to extend the regularity method to sparse graphs. So Kohayatawa and Rudel proved a, a, a regularity lemma in, in sparse graphs in the 90s, and it was more recently refined by Scott, who removed a superfluous condition with a very nice proof. Um, so there's this nice satisfactory sparse regularity lemma now. Uh, so Scott's proof is very similar to the original proof of the regularity lemma, but instead of doing the mean square density function, instead of using the function y equals x squared, you go through the same proof with the function which is y equals x squared up to some point, and then you make it linear from that point onwards. And you go through the same proof, and it works very nicely. Uh, the problem is that uh, to extend many of the very interesting applications of the regularity method to sparse graphs, you'd like to have a counting lemma. And uh, sparse graphs are really important. Uh, some of the most exciting theoretical problems are about sparse graphs, and some of them, and most of the most of the important problems, practical problems, are really about sparse graphs. So we'd like to have a counting lemma in sparse graphs. The problem is, well, a counting lemma in general doesn't hold in sparse graphs. You can show with, the, with these notions of regularity that there are graphs which are just a little bit sparse and, uh, and regular and have zero triangles. So do we just give up here because we don't have a general counting lemma? Well, for many applications, it, it's sufficient and it was noticed by uh, a number of people that it would be enough to prove a, a counting lemma which holds within subgraphs of sparse pseudo-random graphs. And this has been a, a major question in this area to extend uh, the counting lemma to, to this framework. Um, and there's been a number of results in this direction. Recently, David Conlin, uh, my student Yufei Zhao and I, uh, proved a sparse counting lemma in graphs and hypergraphs, which allows you to extend many of the classical results in extremal combinatorics down to sparse graphs and hypergraphs. And it also uh, is related to the recent work of Green and Tao on uh, primes in arithmetic regression. So what is the famous, now famous Green Tao theorem? This was a conjecture in number theory that was open for a couple of centuries. Uh, so they proved that the primes contain arbitrarily long arithmetic regressions, and, and these are some examples. Um, in this direction, this famous theorem of Samrani says that every positive density subset of the integers contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. And uh, the primes are not dense, so it doesn't just follow from, the, from Samaretti's theorem. The number of primes up to n is asymptotically n over log n, and so the density of primes is about 1 over log n up to n. So it doesn't just immediately follow from, from Samaretti's theorem, and one has to do something different. So how do Green and Tau prove their theorem? Well, there's two steps to the proof. The first step is that if you have a set which satisfies certain pseudo-randomness conditions, then you can prove, so this is a relative Samrani theorem, this is what they prove, that every subset of S, a relative positive density, contains arbitrarily long arithmetic regressions. But the second step is to construct a superset of the prime satisfying these conditions. So you construct a set of almost primes, it's a little bit bigger set, and the primes sit within it and have positive relative density. And you show these almost primes behave pseudo-randomly. So this is a, a rough idea of the proof. Now we need to understand what exactly the relative Samaretti theorem says. Um, so you need to know what these pseudo-randomness conditions are. And in the, the work of Green and Tau, there are two types of conditions needed. One's called the linear forms condition, and the other one's called the correlation condition. The linear forms condition is quite natural. It says that for certain linear forms, you should have the right count, as you would expect in a random set of the same density. The correlation condition is less natural, and, and I, I, 
I think, harder to work with. Um, and a basic question that arose after uh, the, work, the, the beautiful work of Green and Tao is, does a relative Sanredi theorem hold with weaker and more natural hypothesis? Um, and what we showed was, in this joint work with David Conlon and Yufei Zhao, is yes, a natural linear forms condition suffices. So you don't need the correlation condition at all, and this uh, shortens somewhat the proof of the Green Tau theorem. And also, you just need a, a weak linear forms condition, so you don't need the whole linear forms condition. And this weak linear forms condition comes out quite naturally from the regularity approach toward, uh, toward um, uh, sparse hypergraphs. So this, in this counting model. Okay. So, I talked about one variant, the sparse regularity method, where you try to extend the regularity lemma down to sparse graphs, but there's now been a, a large number of variants of the regularity lemma that have been established in part to prove certain interesting applications. So uh, one example is uh, weak regularity lemmas, and there are several of them that have been established. Probably uh, the one that's had the greatest impact is this uh, one of Fries and Cannon, although they've all been used for various applications. Um, and the key uh, nice part about these is that they only have exponential type bounds. So that's the, the major benefit of these things. The drawback is that they're not sufficient for many of the applications that we'd like to have. So they're quite good for certain approximation algorithm problems, and that's what many of the applications are. Uh, for certain potential applications of the regularity uh, lemma, you also run into issues because of the fact that they're irregular pairs. There's some small set of pairs which are irregular, and you don't know what to do with those irregular pairs. And to get around this issue, along Fisher, Kribalevich, and Segedi introduced the strong regularity lemma. Now, the strong regularity lemma is proved by iteratively applying the usual regularity lemma. So instead of getting tower bounds, you get the next up in the Ackerman hierarchy bound. So these are called Wowser function. Um, and you get uh, uh, some incredibly uh, weak estimates. Now, uh, it turns out for the strong regularity lemma that uh, these Wowser bounds are indeed necessary. This was joint work that I did with David Conlon, and independently this was done with somewhat weaker bounds by Kalyan Sundaram and Shapira. Uh, however, the strong regularity of lemma has some really impressive applications, um, including the induced graph removal lemma and very general results in graph property testing. And uh, Nova alone has asked to improve the bounds on these various applications. So in this joint work with David Conlon, we also showed that uh, the key consequence of the strong regularity lemma could be proved in a different way without using the strong regularity lemma, and you only get tower type estimates. And so for all these applications in property testing, you only get tower type estimate bounds instead of Wowser type. Now, uh, another really huge direction um, was the hypergraph regularity method. Uh, so for graphs, edges are pairs of vertices, and for k-uniform hypergraphs, you can generalize this so every edge is a k-tuple of vertices. And there was this huge program that was done by Nagel, Riddle, Schock, and Skoken, and independently by Gowers, where they extended the regularity method to hypergraphs, and this yielded many uh, generalizations of the results from graphs to hypergraphs. In particular, it follows quite quickly from the hypergraph removal lemma that you get the, a quick proof of Sanredi's theorem and the multi-dimensional generalization. Um, now, in discrete geometry, there's uh, many graphs that naturally arise where your vertices are either points in some uh, Euclidean space, Rd, or uh, there's some nice algebraic objects and you have certain algebraic relations between them that define whether the pairs are edges or not. Uh, so, uh, to deal with these, alone Pop and Kazi with Deutschek and Schumir proved an algebraic regularity lemma. And here you get the same 
conclusion, except instead of pairs being regular, you get that they're complete or empty. So it's everything's there or nothing's there for, for almost all pairs. And this has nice applications in discrete geometry. Uh, we later, being uh, Gromov, Popnor, the Ford and myself, we later extended this to hypergraphs in order to solve a question of Gromov on uh, uh, high dimensional expanders. And then more recently, uh, in joint work with Yanush Pak and Andrew Soup, we showed that the number of parts is only polynomial in the approximation parameter 1 over epsilon. Okay, now that's one algebraic regularity lemma. Your points, your vertices lie in Euclidean space, RD. Tau proved another algebraic regularity lemma, which uh, has a very similar flavor in some respects, has a very different proof, but it's in the finite field setting. So now your vertices are points in a finite field, and these have some really interesting applications related to some product estimates. Uh, there's also a, a very nice regularity lemma of low loss intensity with bounded VC dimension. So if you have a graph and you know that the neighborhood hypergraph, so for each vertex you have its neighborhood, the vertices adjacent to it, you make a hypergraph and it has bounded VC dimension, then you get a regularity lemma, which is stronger in two aspects than the usual regularity lemma. Both you get a polynomial number of parts in 1 over epsilon, you also get that every pair that you get that's regular, you're going to have density at most epsilon or at least 1 minus epsilon. So it's almost complete or almost empty. Now, uh, there's a special case of this that was approached by Maliaris and Chella, where you forbid a half graph. And in this special case, they proved uh, something stronger that there are no irregular pairs. And this shows some interesting connection between the irregular pairs and, and forbidden half graphs. Finally, there's a huge development uh, started by work with Green and, and Green and Tau on arithmetic regularity lemmas. And uh, so this is an incomplete list, but you get the gist that there's an enormous number of, uh, of regularity lemmas, and they have uh, an incredible number of interesting applications. So uh, in the end of this talk, I want to talk about avoiding regularity. So <laughs> this talk is about the regularity method, but we've seen this terrible drawback that the bounds you get are a, have power type dependence. And the big problem here is to find alternative, alternative proofs of the various applications which avoid using the regularity lemma and give improved bounds. So you have a first proof that uses the regularity lemma. Now that we know that such a statement's true, let's find the right proof. It gets good quantitative estimates. And this can be quite challenging. Um, it's pretty amusing. Probably the person who's been pushing this area the most is Samaradi himself to avoid using his regularity lemma. And, uh, well, there's several alternative methods that have now been developed that have been useful for some of these, uh, some of these problems. One of them is called dependent random choice. And this is a really powerful probabilistic technique. Um, early versions of this were developed by Gowers, Rodel, Kostochka, and Sunikov. And uh, in the work of Gowers, there was a, uh, a very nice lemma of Balog and Samredi in additive combinatorics, where you apply the regularity lemma and you get these power type dependencies. And Gowers found a new proof that uh, using this dependent random choice technique that had a polynomial dependence. And it allowed for, for many more applications in that combinatorics, and it's a real staple in the area. Um, and we'll see many more applications of dependent random choice shortly. Now, another method that, that's been an alternative to the regularity lemma is higher Fourier analysis, which again uses density increment arguments often, but uh, is an alternative tool for the various arithmetic applications. And, um, for example, Gowers uh, developed this higher Fourier analysis in order to give a new proof of San Marini's theorem that had much better quantitative bounds than the previous proof, proofs. And uh, this has had a huge impact on additive combinatorics and theoretical computer science. So that's two methods. Another method that's been quite powerful in, in Ramsey theory is the greedy embedding method. 
And the basic idea of the greedy embedding method is very simple. You're trying to embed a graph in another graph. So let's embed the graph one vertex at a time. Let's try to keep certain nice properties so that you can continue the embedding in some nice way. And what happens if we get stuck? Well, if we get stuck, if there's a good reason for it. It means that some part of your graph is very sparse. And you can use that fact in the complement that you have a very dense part in your graph to try to embed in the complement some nice structure. So it tells you some very nice properties about the graph. And it's been very useful for various applications. This was uh, in early works of Graham, Little, and Rachinsky, and, and others. Um, there's a, la a last technique that I want to mention as well called the absorption method. Suppose you want to embed in a graph a, a spanning structure, like a Hamiltonian cycle or some other sparse spanning structure. Well, you build some nice auxiliary structure that's kind of small, not too large, and you just set it aside. And then you try to, to embed an almost spanning structure which is close to what you're looking for, and you absorb this auxiliary structure into uh, what you've created so far, and you create what you're looking for. So that's this idea of this absorption method. But uh, these various methods, due to having not so much time, I really want to highlight this dependent random choice method. So what does dependent random choice roughly say? It says that every dense graph G, so the rough claim says that every dense graph G contains a large vertex subset U such that all, or almost all, small subsets, so subsets of D vertices, have many common neighbors. Now, this is really useful, this condition that all or almost all small subsets of a, of a given set U has many common neighbors. This is very useful uh, to embed uh, various graphs. And the proof idea, so how would you find this vertex subset U? You can't just take it uniformly at random. It just won't work. So if you think of G as being a disjoint union of two cliques of size n over 2, if you take U at random, it's going to contain vertices from both sides, and no vertex will be adjacent to two vertices on both of these cliques on n over 2 vertices. So you have to do something a little bit more clever, in fact, a lot more clever. So uh, the idea, the very basic idea, is to take a random subset R of appropriate size. You take some small subset of your uh, graph, R, and then you're going to let U be all vertices which are adjacent to every vertex in R. So that's the basic idea. And why does this U have the desired properties? Well, since G is dense, you can apply Jensen's inequality, and you expect that U to be quite large because of the density condition in G. Now, if you have a set of D vertices that has only a few common neighbors, it is unlikely that all the members of this random subset R will be chosen among these few common neighbors. And hence, we don't expect U to contain any such D vertices. So by doing this uh, random, you take a random subset and take the common neighborhood of that random subset, you're skewing away U from containing small, to containing small subsets that have few common neighbors. And putting this together, you get with positive probability, there exists a U with these properties. Now, this is all qualitative. I haven't told you any numbers here. You can put uh, quantitative estimates here by just taking what I said qualitatively and converting it into a quantitative proof. Now, there's been uh, many variations of this basic technique that has been established. Um, and uh, you can combine this dependent random choice technique with many other nice techniques from extreme graph theory and other areas and get many nice applications. So I wanted to discuss a few of the, the many applications that we've had with dependent random choice. Um, so the chromatic number of a graph is the smallest number of colors you need to properly color the vertices of a graph. So that is, you assign each vertex uh, a separate color, and you want to use as few colors as possible. So that's the chromatic number of a graph. And one of the most basic facts in, in graph theory is that the chromatic number of a graph is at least its clique number. This is because you have to assign the vertices of a clique separate colors. 
Some of the most uh, famous problems in graph theory are trying to prove partial converses of this. So uh, the converse is, is clearly false. There are graphs which are triangle-free and have arbitrarily large chromatic number. Uh, but some of the more famous problems is about uh, proving partial converses of this. And one of them is, is known as the Hayosh conjecture. So the Hayosh conjecture, which is quite old, says that uh, if you have a graph of chromatic number k, uh, it must contain a subdivision of a clique on k vertices. So that is a subdivision as you replace edges by paths. So there will be k vertices in your graph, and ver uh, internally vertex disjoint paths between the, k the, the various pairs of, of vertices. So this Hayes conjecture is, is quite nice. It implies Hadleger's conjecture, which is one of the famous open problems in graph theory. It also implies the four-color theorem, uh, which was solved in the, the 70s, that every planar graph or map can be four-colored. It's false, though. Um, there was an example that was discovered in the late 70s by Caitlin Catton that uh, shows that the highest conjecture is false. And then soon after, Erdős and Feindlewicz showed that not only is it false, almost all graphs are counterexamples. So if you consider a random graph on n vertices, uh, they look at the chromatic number and they show that it's roughly n over log n. And the largest clique subdivision you can find is only square root of n. So the chromatic number is much larger in a random graph. And so the random graphs are, are actually quite strong counterexamples of the highest conjecture. And they made a conjecture which quantifies this idea that the random graph is the strongest possible counterexample, but you can't uh, improve on this counterexample. And um, using dependent random choice together with some other tools from the extreme graph theory and Ramsey theory, uh, we solved this conjecture. And this conjecture was featured uh, in this 1981 paper of, of Erdős uh, entitled uh, and the combinatorial problems I would most like to see solved. Uh, another problem from that paper of Erdős from 81 is on homogeneous sets and graphs. Um, so uh, the quantitative form of Ramsey's theorem, due to Erdős and Sekerish, shows that every graph on n vertices contains a homogeneous set that is a clique or independent set of order roughly log n. And Erdős was quite interested in understanding the distribution of these cliques or independent sets, so these homogeneous sets. So if you give every vertex weight 1, and your vertices are the numbers from, from 1 to n, then you'll have this clique or independent set of, of weight log n. Uh, but Erdős wanted to know, what if you give each uh, vertex i weight 1 over log i? Now, that's an appropriate choice because uh, from the from Ramsey's theorem, you get a clique or independent set of size log n, but uh, the the weight of each of these vertices will only be at least one over log n that we know, and so you'll get a, a clique or independent set whose weight is only at least a constant. And Erdős conjectured that uh, the weight should tend to infinity; they should be able to find a large weight uh, homogeneous set. And further, he asked to estimate how large of a weight uh, of a homogeneous set can you find. Uh, this conjecture was solved by Rodel, who, uh, if you heard the beautiful plenary talk by Ben Green this morning, where he said, you know, certain problems give number theorists bad names, this problem gives combinatorialists bad names, um, because uh, Rodel gave a, a beautiful construction which gives an upper bound of log 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 n which one may guess uh, would suggest that maybe the, the answer is actually constant. But then he also showed that there's a lower bound, which is four logs of n over five logs of n. And uh, when I first saw this, it was an undergraduate student, and I was really amazed at how one would come up with such, such bounds. But actually, it's really quite natural. So if you look at Riddle's beautiful paper on this, um, uh, you'll... Uh, you'll see that it's really a very natural uh, uh, approach. And using dependent random choice, together with some additional tools, we solved the Erdős problem 
recently and, and worked with Conlin and Sudikov, where we show that the answer is indeed three logs of n. And more generally, we have a good understanding of how the large weight uh, uh, homogeneous set you have to get, uh, given a different type of weight function. So depending on what the weight function is, we understand how big of a weight of a homogeneous set. So the next natural question, instead of 1 over log i, should be 1 over log i times 3 logs of i. So the denominator is log i times 3 logs of i. And the question is, how large of a weight homogeneous set can you find? And the answer turns out to be 5 logs of n. And if you divide out the next natural choice after that, would be your weight function would be 1 over log i times 3 logs of i times 5 logs of i, then you get 7 logs. And it continues like this. And it, gives, uh, it tells you really what's going on for this original Irish problem. <coughs> now, there's been many more applications. I'm, I'm running out of time here. So uh, there was a series of papers of Duke, Erdős, and Rodel on a, a notion called cycle connectivity. And um, you can use this dependent random choice to solve one of the, the main questions here. Um, and then uh, there was a question of Bolovash and and Erdős and, and many others about the critical window for the classical ramsey turn problem. And you can use dependent random choice here again with additional tools to, to, say, to, to answer this problem. And there's uh, many other famous problems in this area of extremal common choice where you can make at least some, some good progress using this dependent random choice technique. Um, so with that, I want to finish by saying uh, that this area is, is uh, fastly uh, is, is quickly developing, and there's there's many more applications that are being discovered quite frequently, and um, so it's a really exciting time to be uh, in this area, and it's all been inspired by this beautiful work of Sam Reddy from the 70s on regularity, and uh, I want to finish by thanking you. Thank you, Jacob. Questions? Comments? Thank you for leaving some open. Open yeah. question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, the other questions, I mean, I think it's getting played. You will get that. Uh, your your Thank box. You, Thank you again.